The competitors were the Ashton Underline Grammar School Band, conductor Barry Cheshire, and the Broken Cross Secondary School Band Macclesfield, conductor Michael Broadhurst. You'll remember, of course, they weren't necessarily playing in that order. Well, now it's time for the adjudicator's turn, and here are Ted Buttress and James Langley. Firstly, Jim, there we have your comments on band number one. Well, band number one, we thought, gave us a very well-chosen and well-contrasted program. There were four items quite different in mood and tempo, which made overall very good listening. They made quite a good start for their march standard, but there were some divergence of opinion as to exactly what the tempo was. As the, as the march proceeded, we noticed the top line was a little underweight, as if either players were short or perhaps needing another couple of strong players to help the volume. There was much emphasis on the middle of the band. The bottom and the top was not always balanced. And the band in general, we thought, in this item, needed to get a few more softer dynamics and a better tonal blend in the various sections. In salute to Sullivan, the start wasn't very happy. There was a bit of overblowing in the trombones and some wrong notes. And again, a very weak top line uh, at uh, letter A. We thought you could have made a lot more of the style of this selection. They're, they are, in fact, as you know, uh, songs from the operas, and really they need singing, even when played on the band, and put over a little bit more. A, a sort of read of the words of some of these numbers would help to create the right mood, we felt. The general performance was, rather, again, too much on one level. We enjoyed the work of the euphonium. Occasionally, he tended to dominate. And there could have been more variety of tempo, we thought, here between the various numbers. But all in all, a very creditable effort. Tuning was pretty fair, and the end was quite well done. It would not have disgraced quite a few of our senior bands, we felt. Uh, the change of mood at Idlewise is quite nicely done. Quite a sweet tone from the solo cornet. You need a little bit more body in the sound, perhaps, to make it carry a little bit more, so that it becomes more soloistic. Uh, we felt there were too many accents uh, in the accompaniment. The um chuck chucks were a bit pervasive. It needs to feel one in a bar, generally, like a slow Viennese waltz, which in fact it is. Um, band number one ended with two movers from Panic Seascape. And here we felt a little bit more weight was required from everyone at the opening. It is marked ponderously. And the staccato quavers at the end of every bar we felt could have been played more purposefully. The unisons and octaves found out the tuning weakness, as in fact they always do, and it was rather feeble at letter D, we thought. Trombones must be more careful of tuning, especially mezzo forte and above, and the band in general, we thought, could have tried, should try to make a more open sound all round the various sections. The sound itself is quite good, but too often rather muffled. Now, Ted, that's you for band number two. Before saying anything about band number two, can we say a little about the programmes? Uh, Jim and I did say, always take this into account, of course, and we certainly came down on the side of band number one because they saw the variety of items and they did change the mood completely by the use of uh, Edelweiss, uh, which uh, we thought was right. The band number two, they, all the items you chose were sort of up and down items, if you like to call them that. They, they were two fours, you had two six eights following each other, and uh, four four, everything was sort of one thing. If we had considered the change and put in a waltz type thing or something as the other band did, uh, put the three four movement in, this does make for good listening over the air people then do enjoy what is going on. Uh, on to the programme itself, the flying machines, here again the, the band were a little bit upset to start with, uh, a little bit nervous, and it didn't uh, get off to a very good start, there was a lack of clarity in the detail, but in general it was a bright style until we moved on and then we, we started to go a little bit adrift and it got a little untidy and uh, we did note quite a few problems of notation in the chord section. Bridge over to the water, this arrangement of Frank Weiss is, is not easy to play, and uh, very often we, we found that the band were not clear in the diction, in the, particularly in the introduction on this. It's so controlled, this, uh, this introductory 
eight bars that uh, it's got to handle very, very carefully indeed. Euphonium player is rather light in style, and sometimes the band got over the top of him and we lost a melodic line through, through this. So just to take a little bit more care in balance, they, again we got this problem of faulty intonation, uh, it's just need examining among the cornet section. On now to the northeast hymn, if you like to call it such, Blade and Races. A fair start, uh, but we felt that the rhythmic accompaniment was part with the cornets when they answer the euphonium and say, this has got to be very delicately played, and you can only get this, this method if everybody is playing exactly together, but unfortunately the two or three people playing were not always together, and so the thing became rather dull, it stopped it down. It was a quite a good effort by this soloist himself. When we came to the 4-4 section, the tuning problems again arose, and we felt that the soloist had lost some of his confidence in this particular part, but when we did the recapitulation, it was better once again uh, to take us down to the finish. And on to the holst, the dargazon. Here we started off, started with a good tempo, but um, we got the impression that the band wanted to take a different tempo to the conductor. I'm not quite sure about this, but this is how it appeared to us, because one or two wanted to push along and others didn't. Uh, when they're playing the 6-8, when the euphonium is playing the melody of the green sleeves, it is terribly important that the cornets and the other people that are still playing the 6-8 style must be very, very rhythmical indeed, because if you don't, the whole context of the thing has been destroyed, and uh, it makes the tempo drag rather badly. On to now what has almost become a you could call it folk tune of Rafa Bunz, I think, it's an It's been played by so many people. A bit carefully played, and we were saying in the control room there, for goodness sake, relax and swing it. Let, let's hear it swinging along. Don't, don't just play notes on paper. Let it go. Let's feel some of this dancidium coming through so that uh, it really gets off the ground and you, you make people swing about with it. A little bit loose in general, uh, at when we got into the faster movement, but uh, it, it, was, it was quite a bright end to a performance. However, a very, very close contest, I can assure you of that. There's no outstanding winner in this particular one, but uh, Jim and I, on quality merit, send on to the next round, band number two. two. Well, band number two was the Ashton Underline Grammar School Band. They go through to the semi-finals where they'll meet Glossop School Band. And here they are to play us out with their signature tune. <laughs> 